start back on the, the actual content of the presentation. I gave you the first things to talk to you because I wanted to get your mind in the right space, and I think you're already in a good spot right now. But let's just look at some of the factoids uh, about this. There's a lot of chronic diseases. I've given you a list here that puts a, a few out. Uh, a good number of these you have already seen and talked about. Uh, heart disease, diabetes, COPD, and asthma are all pretty chronic diseases that can really change people's lives, as you've seen. But there are others as well. Uh, cancer can be considered a chronic disease for a lot of people. Um, it's not necessarily a, a terminal event, but people are managed for long stretches of time. Um, the data is hard to collect on this across the country, but this is still it's still useful. This is 2012. They don't keep stacking it up all the time. They look back over long stretches. So we're, this is about as recent as you can get. Uh, about half of all adults have one or more chronic health conditions. That's a lot of people. Okay, 117 million out of about 240 million adults, you know, in America. 25% of all adults have two or more chronic health conditions, probably because we live a lot longer. You know, people live longer, things will begin to show up, and that's a large part of our population. And in your practice, a lot of times that geriatric population is going to just explode. It continues to explode as people live longer. They live longer to experience more chronic ailments. Um, Seven of the top ten causes of death um, in 2010 were chronic diseases, as you might expect. Heart disease and cancer, and you would know this from your own life experience, make up about half of it. And that's still true in Oklahoma. It's, in Oklahoma, it's actually a little bit more than that because we're so high on the stack, the charts for cancer and for heart disease. Um, some of the big chronic diseases that we've looked at over the course of the semester, semester so far, obesity, one third of adults are obese. Uh, that was back in 2009-10. It's a little more than one third right now. It continues to rise. Um, and I think the figure that's really shocking to me, one in five youths, two to 19 years old, is obese. I'll tell you, I, looked, I did a talk for medical social workers last week and I looked at some of the information again. And we had maps of America and then states were colored in different colors based on what percent of the population was obese. And they had 1990, 2000, 2010, and then projection of 2020 because we're almost on top of that now. In America, it just, it has exploded. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. I mean, it's, it, it's actually pretty distressing that we're over a third in America right now. Oklahoma is, is on the high side. We're in the top five for obesity uh, as an epidemic uh, within the state. Uh, but it also, the, the body weight of the whole nation has gotten larger. I remember when I was in training back in the, the late 70s, early to mid 80s, you never saw anybody with type 2 diabetes that was a teenager. I mean, you never saw it. I mean, literally never saw it. Most, we were all taught if type 2 diabetes showed up somewhere between 35 and 40 years old. That was about the, the usual. Now, there'd be a, a few exceptions here and there, but most of us, what it was. Well, now, you, it is not unusual to see diabetes in a 15 or 16 year old, to me, which is the tragedy of all tragedies, 13 and 14 year old person with diagnosed type 2 diabetes. And think about how long that person could live. And think about the morbidity that will rack their body as they get older, even if you do everything you're supposed to do. So to me, it's really a tragedy, the, the weight gain as part of it, you know, the manifestation. And we see a lot of it here in Oklahoma. A lot of you are from Oklahoma, some of you are not, but but most of you for me was rural areas. When you get into rural areas of Oklahoma, you will see unhealth just driving down the street. I mean, I've got, I, I grew up in very rural Alabama, and it was the same thing. People who have bad diets, inactive, overweight, and it's not just a person. It's just people, just the population. So there will be a great need for all kinds of health care. If you do everything you can do as a PA, wherever you choose to practice, it won't be enough. And if everybody does all they can do, it won't be enough because there is so much uh, chronic disease uh, continuing to explode. Arthritis is another common cause of disability. Um, and that's, you see how many people are disabled by that 22 to 55 million are disabled in some way, in some fashion from arthritic complaints. 
you'll see that in older people it does limit mobility. You know, kind of like your grandmother moved down from Wisconsin, but she's got the lung, you know, the lung disease. But as you get older, uh, arthritis makes it harder to walk and move. And then if you have decreased lung capacity, it makes it even harder. So it really becomes fairly immobilizing, uh, just uh, all in all. And then diabetes, you already know, number one cause of kidney failure, lower limb amputations, and blindness are from diabetes. Go to any dialysis center, most of the people are diabetic, and that's where they've gotten, how they've gotten there. Okay, the, we know that the, yes. Uh -huh. uh, quick note, these sure. screens are not updating as well as your screen. Okay, mine, where are you on that? We are on the first slide. I may be, let me do this. I bet what's, what it does. Now we're here. There we go. It's working. Yep. Y'all there? Okay, now y'all with me. Yep. Okay, sorry. Um, now I gotta get my screen right. This is just a mess. Sorry. <laughs> Is your mouse on your screen? Do you want them all to be the same screen? Uh, yep, I do. See on your screen right now. It's not a, a, a sprint, it's a marathon. And that's kind of the psychology you have to move into when you become a healthcare provider where you're doing chronic disease management. You're in it for the long haul with that patient because they're in it for the long haul too. So trying to get to quick endpoints, trying to solve problems immediately is really not the goal. The goal is to kind of be with them where they are and help solve the problems of the moment and then keep adding to it and teaching them as time goes by. Okay, uh, so 
the most important person in the process is not the provider. And right now, it's really hard to see that or feel that completely because there's so much focus on what you do and what you need to know. That's very normal. But at some point, it will begin to transfer over. You know what you want to do, and then when you get comfortable doing that, then you can start focusing on where are they as opposed to what to do. You're kind of at the right place you need to be at for right now, but it will transition in your second year as you move through that. You begin to get a sense of that, and then you go into practice. You begin to have a sense of self as a practitioner, and then you begin to identify each individual person. What do they need and to individualize and to help that patient uh, deal with it. So you have to operate from the patient's perspective. You have to know what they think. You have to understand where they are. You have to know their context. And that will become more important, literally, than any medical thing that you do, is where are they? Because in the end, you get judged by how effective you are. And in some ways, I think it's unfair. You get judged by how effective you are, but it's the patient who's responsible for the outcome. It's almost like if I had that kind of magic, I would just make the world not do the behaviors that led to that. So when healthcare providers get judged for the outcomes of the patients, it somehow seems to say you're 100% responsible for what happens. And the truth is the patient is. You have a role, but it's not your fault if they don't make it because they, they may choose not to do things and you get a black mark on your name because the A1C is a better. Well, they don't do things. That's why you see practitioners cherry picking patients over time. They don't schedule them back because if they're in a practice plan or some practice group where you're being looked at for your final outcomes and you have patients who won't do what you say because of all kinds of social issues and, and resource issues, then they may not schedule them back because the population ends up being the ones who will follow what you say. Okay, now is that good or bad? I'm not, I'm not judging, I'm just telling you how it happens that when people who are, who are not adherent don't come back, sometimes folks just let them go. Because if they're going to get a, a, bad, they're going to get a bad grade because of what the patient's not doing, then maybe they don't want that bad grade because people are tying money to it. Okay, this is just the unholy truth of the way the whole, the whole thing runs. But just be aware. So the more you are able to understand patient, connect with them, the better your outcomes are going to be. Okay, thoughts and feelings of patients living with a chronic disease. Okay, here's a lady. This is not unlike a lot of people. A lot of things, and you see how depressed she is. She's kind of sad about things, and that's probably true too. So here's some questions you can ask your patients, and I think you do have to kind of pepper your questioning. And we're going to talk a lot about things to ask. What can you, how can you phrase things? Um, and you just kind of pepper your interaction with patients with things like this that more get in get you into their head like I need you to tell me about this okay not putting on them what you think they're doing based on your observation but actually getting them to talk to you how did you feel when you were first diagnosed with blank whatever the chronic disease is how are you feeling now what does having blank mean to you how do you see your future living with X how are you currently handling the concerns of self-care for whatever you got Okay, you heard from the woman earlier on what that disease meant to her. It really left her with a lot of questions. She envisioned a quote unquote normal life, which she's telling us not to normalize anything, but she had envisioned the traditional life and she doesn't know if she's going to have it at all. Okay, so here's some responses to a diagnosis of a chronic disease. Shock and denial can be the first thing. I don't have that. I've had a ton of patients who have that. I don't have high blood pressure. I don't have diabetes. Y'all measure wrong. That's just a temporary thing. It's not real. Uh, I'm not, I don't have it, so I'm not going to do anything with it. They don't tell you that, but their behavior tells you that. Okay? They don't buy it. Um, how patients can cope with these feelings, you have to encourage people to talk about how they feel about what they've got. Now some people won't open up to you on visit one or visit two, but if you keep poking into that area, how are you doing? How's this affecting your life? What's going on at home because of this? You start getting them to understand that that's part of what you need to know on a visit. And they'll tell you. Um, help them realize that what they're feeling is normal. 
you really have to help people normalize what is apparently not comfortable for them or seemingly not normal. What's wrong with me? Everybody else seems to be doing okay with whatever, but nobody really quite knows what other people are doing uh, or how they're feeling. Um, you have to encourage patients to focus on positives and to learn about the things that are within their power to manage. Part of shock and denial is if I deny and don't deal with it, it'll go away. But what you have to do is help people get a hold of what things they can do. And it's that motivational interview that we talked about even in the expert. What can you do and what will you choose to do right now? And build them up, encourage them. And you can help a person learn how to take care of themselves and feel good about it. Okay? There's a lot to feel good about. They can do it. And as they have success, they feel even better. Another one, anger and resentment. Okay? We had anger. You know, um, anger was talked about here, the chronic condition of being a student in a program that you can't control, okay? But here's another, is anger and resentment. I don't want to have this disease. It's not fair. Um, I've been cheated. Uh, and why does so-and-so not have it? You know, why have I got this? Okay? You have to let people know it's okay to be angry, and you have to give people space to be angry. When you're a new practitioner, I will guarantee you the first angry patient that comes at you, they will upset you and they will make you mad back at them. Why are you coming in here and I'm taking care of your act and you're talking ugly to me like that? Okay, and there are some people who can be pretty doggone ugly in the room. And it will make you mad and you don't, I don't need this crap. Okay, that's kind of how you'll feel. <clears throat> but as you get more mature in yourself, and you, and you begin not to personalize everything coming at you, then you just observe it for what it is. They're angry. Are they angry with you? They might be. You might be the closest thing to get mad at, but where's that coming from? What is that? It's okay to be mad. If you will give people permission to be mad and accept that, they go away from mad faster than you think. But when you push back on it and resist it, it I'm mad, you know, when you're sitting up there, oh, you're acting mad about pop, you know, it just goes on. As soon as you go, I, I understand, I hear that you're really furious. Okay? If they've been hurt, now they can, they can take another, another step with you. But you have to let that happen. But I'm telling you, there's going to be a day where you just kind of go, mm -hmm, sucker, you know. <laughs> you just cannot do this. You can't do it. Keep, keep the job. But it's okay, let them get out. Um, but don't let them let resentment overwhelm. Okay, people can be resentful to the point of immobility. Okay, in this program, if you resent what you have to study, sometimes you just shut stuff down and pull it out of your notebook. I don't want to do it. I'm mean, resenting it, and I'm angry. I'm just not going to do it. Don't go on it. I'll miss those questions. I don't care. It's only about X percent of the tests. I'll pass anyway. Okay, been there, done that. It happens. Normal. <laughs> not hard. Not too hard. Um, help people set realistic expectations and know that's, that whatever they've got cannot be managed perfectly. Help them feel good about what they can do, no matter how small. If you're a perfectionist like the wombats are, you, if you get an illness, you will want to do it perfectly. Nobody ever gets on top of illness completely, perfectly. You can be pretty good most of the time. Uh, but there are some things that people have that you just cannot get in front of. It's there, you have to kind of accommodate to, adapt to, work with, kind of be flexible with it inside. Here's another one, guilt and self-blame. Guilty because you have a diagnosis of a chronic disease. Especially diseases where the world thinks it's what you did yourself. Okay, you eat a bad diet, you get overweight, you're immobile, you're obese, now you have diabetes seen this a bunch of times. Well, if you hadn't eaten like a hog all these years, you wouldn't be a diabetic. And so, and the family puts it back on them. You know, it's your fault. You're overweight. You, you, if you keep eating all that stuff, you're going to get the sugar diabetes. And then when they get the diabetes, the family blames them. Then as they have needs or things happen like an amputation or in a wheelchair, they have to walk around, then the family hates them even more. So this thing about guilt and self-blame there's help a lot of times, you know, to get them to that point. Um, but you have to be different and better and help that person understand um, not to blame themselves. In fact, people with diabetes don't give themselves diabetes. Okay, this is a subtle point, but an important point. People don't give themselves diabetes. 
they have genetic makeup, they have tendencies toward, who knows when that's going to express itself. Now being overweight and sedentary may make it manifest itself sooner, but did you make yourself have Dobby's? No, the, gen the genes are set when you're born, it's already in the tank. And then depending on how you live your life, it may show up sooner or later. You can be skinny as a stick and have type 2 diabetes. What they do? Should they be guilty? You know, who knows? So I think you have to kind of help people see the bigger picture and not live in that I did it to myself event. Okay, in some regards they've done things that weren't healthy. You have to help them begin to undo things that aren't healthy to, the, to whatever extent they can do it. Okay, can't change the past, can't undo what's been done, but they can make different choices moving forward. Um, it's like I tell obese people, you can never tell them you need to lose 150 pounds. It's impossible. I mean, it's just an overwhelming task to consider. So I just tell them, you know, it took you a number of years, a number of years to get from whatever weight you want to be at to the weight you're at now. And it will take a number of years not to be there. So all we need to do is quit walking in the direction of heavier and heavier. Just stop right here, get a hold of it, turn around, and make choices, and then slowly go back the other direction. And if in any movement in the right direction, praise it, because that's the right way to go. But to sit there and go, you're 100 pounds overweight, they almost quit listening to you. I mean, if I heard, I'll just kind of tune you out. Well, duh, thank you. You know, I'm not supposed to pay for that. I don't, I don't need that. That's, they won't think that. Another response is sadness, worry, and de uh, depression. Okay? So that's, those are pretty common. Um, you have to help people realize, again, that's also a normal response. It's not an abnormal response to be that way. You have to help them talk about things. You have to assess what level of depression they might have, what level of anxiety they might have, what level of whatever emotional dysfunction they have. Um, and then help and, and judge, are you so far down that you need a certain therapy or is it something we can talk about and just unloading the burden of it will be helpful. Okay. What, do people, what are people's feelings, attitudes, and perceptions about chronic disease? Well, I've got six words that, you can, that people can use to describe it and sometimes they may be on different words at different times of their journey. But burden, some people feel like having chronic disease is a burden because it is. Some people look at it as a challenge. You know, the people who still feel like they have emotional resources, I mean, it's a challenge, but I'm going to win. I'm going to beat so-and-so. You, you hear that? Good. I'll, I'll help a fired-up person to ch be um, a champion over something or challenge it and win. Another is opportunity. Some people look at their chronic disease as kind of a wake-up call, but a chance to do something different in their life. Okay, now I know I have heart disease. At least I didn't die from a heart attack. Now I can do this. Uh, I was talking to Professor La Victoire uh, yesterday. And she was in the Duncan ER over the weekend, and a man was on the sideline of a, I don't know if it was a jamboree or some football event they're watching, and he had a heart attack. Just collapsed and somebody in the stands knew where an AED was and they defibrillated him on the spot. Yeah. Um, and he survived, woke up in the ER and said, oh, I think I must have had a heart attack. It's like, yep, yeah, you're right. You, know, <laughs> you not only had a heart attack, but you went from that football field to this ER to unconscious to, to being back, you know, back with it. Um, but then he's like, well, he didn't die. You know, a lot of people die the first time they know they get heart disease is they're dead, which is no recourse at all. So they, so he looked looked at us. Well, I can do some things. I can change. Like 50 something years old, very overweight, and okay, here you go. You can go on. Some people look at it as a problem, just a, a problem of a nuisance. Some look at it as a disaster, like their life is now over, and some get depressed. Okay, so those those all kind of make sense. Problem solving, you have to become a teacher of how to teach somebody how to solve problems in their life. Okay, your job in so many ways will be the detective to figure out and help people decide how, how help them define their problems and then help them find solutions to their problems. And you will find yourself over time with some people working through all kinds of different ways to get something to work. Uh, from, you know, 
medication regimens, to lifestyle changes, to monitoring, to whatever they have to do, is you keep trying to figure out what they can do that works for them. In the end, you can come up with something for almost everybody that works for them, but it may be very different. But you have to know who they are and what can they do and what they choose to do so that you can get them to a better place. Okay, and that's it's very doable. So let's look at a few things. Okay, people with chronic disease have bunches of problems every day. As a healthcare provider, I, I see this all the time with new practitioners. You want to solve every problem you can identify as soon as you see it on that visit. Okay, go to Good Shepherd. There's too many problems in the tank. There, it's way too many problems in the tank. So you have to prioritize a problem or two. It's nice if they tell you what bugs them the most, so you can kind of work in that direction. But you, they have to solve a ton of problems, and, and when you're new, you want to solve them all at one time. And it actually, if you give people a laundry list of things to do, mostly when they go home, they don't do anything. It's just too many words. And so they just stop, and then you're mad because they come back, it's all the same. Nothing is different. Okay, too much, too many things to do. So you have to teach them how to solve the problem by doing, teaching them self-care education. Okay, diabetes is a good example. We can kind of use that one. Okay, and, and you know from all of your studies in diabetes so far, there's many things. What do you eat? How do you act? Where do you take medicine? How do you inject? How do you monitor? How do you change doses? Where do you get your stuff at? Uh, who do you have to go see when? Uh, what do you have to do if this happens? It's just a bunch of different things that, that come up. Um, and you don't want to overwhelm them. So you start with one area the patient feels the challenge, the one they want to tackle. That's why it's very smart when you're talking to somebody to figure out two things. I figure out what's going to kill you first. If they're in the room, I want to know what's going to get you first. Okay, if they come back there and say they're having hypoglycemia at night time, three times a week, that's my problem for you because I don't need you to go to sleep tonight and never wake up. That's a big problem. You can't ignore that. That cannot leave the room. Okay, that's the one. So solve that one. That might be all you can do that day. Okay, just given patients' ability to accommodate and hear you. But if they have something else, I always like to ask the question, what's the thing that is bothering the most? If we could pick one thing to fix today, what will that be? Now, if it happens to be bedtime hypoglycemia, then okay, we're all on the same page here. But if it happens to be something else, I will take care of the high priority item and maybe put in uh, and start working towards what they say they want. Okay? And then that way, you've got, they're listening to me and they're helping me where I won't help and then you're not letting them harm themselves beyond return, you know, at the same time. Okay. You always want people to describe their problem being specific. People all the time are very, not very specific. You know this when you go into the room at Good Shepherd and talk to patients. You come back out and we ask you about 500 more questions. And you go back in and ask those questions. They tell you stuff. You come back and tell us. You go back in there and ask them this. It's just that definition of problem. There's details you need to know, um, and it seems like you're in there forever, but it's because your experience is not that great to know how to zoom in on the, the question. But it's okay, you're learning. That's how it kind of happens. You ask all those questions to get specifics because it's the specifics that will help you actually create a solution. And the one I've got on here is can't take, med can't remember to take medicines, too vague, can't remember to take uh, medicine in the morning, but, I, but uh, I, I can remember the morning, but not before supper. That's more specific. Then you start thinking about it. And then I think about, well, do we have to take one before supper? Can I do once a day here? Can I do this there? Where are you when supper happens? Are you out of the house? Are you in the house? So I start trying to figure out details. Brainstorm ways they can do it. Do you need an alarm clock? Do you need somebody in the house to tell you? Do you need to set the medicines out on the table so you can use them? That's a good strategy for some people, but it's not a good strategy for people with children in the house because medicine looks like candy. So, okay, you can't remember that. So you have to figure another way. Okay. Then once they've done it, you have to have them identify thoughts and attitudes that come with a problem. Most people who have problems um, will have a, an attitude about it. 
if they forget, let's say they forget their medicine before supper and you keep and they get frustrated with it, then they become mad. And the reason they forget is because when they walk in, their let's say it's the husband, the wife starts asking what he did at work, he gets mad, and then they get into a little fight and then he just forgets all about the medicine. Okay, so then we have to talk about how to come in, when to think about doing it, uh, and move it around to get a more positive experience and not a negative experience, and always focus on progress they have made. And then the final thing is whatever you decide to do, just try it and follow up. You, you don't have to try a bunch of stuff with people, okay? Um, you know, Taylor, you were a dietitian, you have to work with people on what they'll eat. Can you try this? Okay, I can't stand that. Okay, could you do this? You just keep working with people until they come up with their stuff. Everybody will have a different way of pulling off a solution. So I just have people try stuff. If it fails, I don't need to get upset. How'd that work? Didn't work. Okay, let's, let's think again. What we're going to do different this time? Until they figure out something they thought. Sometimes they will try something on their own and say, well, I decided to do this, and it might have actually been pretty good. It's like, good, let's go with that. They're working with you, and you can work with them too. It's really good. Okay, but you have to look at failures as ways of finding out what does not work. So when, you come, when a patient comes back and they haven't been able to do anything you said, your first inclination as a person, as a practitioner, is to be irritated with them. I went through all this stuff and you didn't do anything. Okay? Try to avoid that if possible. Uh, and say, okay, well now we've learned what didn't work. Let's try to go another direction. And that way it isn't rejecting them or being angry with them. It's just we're marking off things that don't work in your house. Okay? And then they'll help, they'll, they'll stay with you. Thomas Edison said the greatest weakness lies in giving up. Okay, some patients who don't have success early and then their practitioner fusses with them, they don't come back. They just fade out. Okay, because every time I go over there, all they do is just tell me what I'm doing wrong. I don't need that drag on my life. And so they don't come back. Why would they? So now healthcare is not happening at all. It's a zero. So what we do in the room is really important to keeping the person in care where they can get benefit. Even if you have to tolerate some messes along the way. Okay. Motivation. What motivates people? Good question. Money. <laughs> hey, that's a good motivator, but you can't pay your patients to take the medicines. They're already paying to get them, than to pay to take them. Okay. You're, a patient is always in their head while you are talking. They're figuring out the benefits of what you're saying versus how much it's going to cost them to get the benefit. And not necessarily like pocketbook cost, but time cost and thinking time and bother. You know, my life is good the way it is. I don't want to have to do that. Um, so they're always balancing out what are you telling me to do and how much time it's going to take to pull that off. Here's, what, here's the questions that people ask themselves, you know, patients, what are the hassles involved? What do I have to do to make this change? What will happen if I don't, okay? What will I get in exchange for the hassle? People are deciding things about what you say, and that could be wrong. Like, it ain't going to be, I won't really get much benefit if I do that. Yeah, you're saying that, but I don't think it's going to really help me that much. So they might dismiss it. If you don't explain you have to tie together outcomes and health with what you want them to do. If you just focus on what they're supposed to do, they sometimes lose sight of what you're trying to get. You know, what do you want? I'm trying to have this. Do you want to lose your eyesight? Do you want your kidneys to blow out? Your creatinine is already 2.1. you got diabetes. Your blood sugar stays 300. Dialysis will ruin your life. You think your life is bad now? You wait till that happens, you will be tied down to going someplace three times a week and you will not have freedom of movement, not like you used to. So I, I, I'm not trying to scare them, but I go, okay, we're trying to do this, help them understand and tie this behavior to this outcome so they get the benefit. Sometimes it's so obvious to us what the benefit is, it's not obvious to them. Motivation is the inside event that moves us to do things. Uh, and as I said, we're balancing costs and benefits in the way we think. 
All right. So motivation, you have to be thinking about motivation when you're talking to patients. It's always part of your little dialogue, what makes you move. Relapses, they are going to happen. You will not have patients who do not relapse. You will have a lot of patients who will relapse. They will fall apart. And don't get upset when that happens because it's going to happen. Have you ever had any behavior that you chose to do where you stopped doing it? Okay, I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to not eat this stuff. Okay, can I go for about a month or two? Looking really good. Look at me. I got it going. Then all of a sudden, you're tired of doing it. And you decide to do something else. Or you go to somebody's party. Mm, that looks good. And then you eat a little bit, and it's like cocaine. Oh, man, I forgot what she was like. That's me. I eat a piece of cake. Okay, I've got to go have some more. <laughs> so I forgot all this good that was out there. So people will relapse. They, they had behaviors like they had because they liked them. And then you're having them give up things because you got the risk-benefit thing operating in the right mode. They're choosing to go with you, so you're all kind of moving over your towards health. And then all of a sudden, somebody gives them a, a look in the rearview mirror, and they kind of go back, and then they're heading that direction. Okay, chalk it up to being human. They're human. <laughs> Don't get too fussy. You have to help them understand what's going on. As I said earlier, nobody can manage um, of X, whatever disease, perfectly all the time. A lapse of a day or two, that can happen. But relapses can be full blown where they turn into the next three months. Um, and that can lead to some bad outcomes too. So you have to work with folks. Here's what you can ask them. If they have a relapse, describe the situations that cause the slip up with your self care, with your diabetes. What are your thoughts when you don't follow through with your plan? Sometimes people will feel guilty. I just go there and I see all this stuff and she's such a good cook and I eat it all and I really, really like it, but then I go home and I feel guilty. But I really like the food. And so there's this tug of war going on about what they like versus what they know they shouldn't do. So it's the guilt, benefit, thing back and forth. Um, but so you want to think about what are your thoughts when you don't follow through because that emotion if you can get them to talk about that feeling, I wish I had not done that, or I have a sense of guilt, you work with that because that's what you have to capture with them is that sense so that you can, they, they want to avoid that. So you work with that uh, emotion. Can you think of things that trigger a relapse in self-care? Okay, it can be all kinds of things. Um, I have, you know, marital discord, children, financial issues. Anything that throws people emotionally off, that's when uh, self-control and selection of behavior starts to suffer. Uh, so a lot of times when people fall apart, I don't get upset with them, gain 10 pounds, blood sugar is now 350. Uh, it's like, okay, what's going, on, what's going on in your world right now? Okay, it could be somebody died. It could be my wife left me. It could be... So and so, my son got diagnosed with cancer. It could be a lot of things that all of a sudden the emotional energies that were channeled towards good behaviors is just kind of, you don't have the energy for that, so you channel it into the other emotional needs of the moment and you let this stuff go. Because I feel like we all have a capacity limit and if we kind of overwhelm our system, then it's hard to keep going along. Okay. Okay. You have to help people think ahead if they can anticipate and know what's a problem, then you work with them on solving the, you solving the problem before you get to it. Um, okay, we just talked about these triggers. Situations causing anxiety or stress. Pleasurable feelings like a celebration, go to the wedding, eat the cake. Social pressure, people want you to eat. Relationship conflict or uh, other people's place or things. I had a, um, this was pretty typical, I had a lot of African American patients that I saw in practice and it was almost always true that in the summer families had family reunions and there's big family, like 70 people, 80 people, 100 people, 200 people, they rent out a hotel room, you know, hotel ballroom and have a big deal. And when they go there, they have to eat for a lot of reasons. It's the social custom. If you don't eat so-and-so's food, then you don't like them, so you have to kind of like them. You know, you take a loss over your plate. 
and people are watching you. Well, you took that, but you only took a little slice. You didn't eat, I guess you. But they, it's a it's a big social pressure on people to do that. So we had to get ready for family reunions for some people. They had to go. They could not go. But then if they went, then it was the danger of the the deadly invasion of all these foods. And then once they got the taste, then you, they're coming back in that road again. So we talked about sample size, and we talked about telling your family, I've got diabetes, you know, and I'm going to eat a few things, I will taste a few, but I really shouldn't get big servings, I need you to help me, help me make it through. That way, you're not hiding it and trying to be just normal with everybody, you're a little bit more open. And in a large African American family, a lot of people will have diabetes at the event anyway. So it's kind of like helping you help each other. Um, and sometimes that works. I mean, sometimes it would. Sometimes you go to the trash can and drop your plate over. You know, <laughs> don't eat everything that's given to you. But we talked about it, and they would have strategies. You want to help people remember positive experiences when they were successful in not responding to a trigger. If they went to a reunion and they did not gain five pounds, and they pretty much got out of there without overeating, then that's a praiseworthy event. What did you do? How did it work? What? worked, you know, in those interactions. And that's something they can hold on to for other places they go. And you, you know, make as many plans as you can. Okay. Another thing you have to teach a person after a relapse is that they have to learn how to practice forgiveness to self. Okay. High uh, intensity people are the least likely to forgive themselves. Y'all are probably fairly unforgiving of things you don't do. Okay, it's no, it's no judgment against you. I'm just saying people who are high performers don't tend to be very self-forgiving when they don't perform at the level they're supposed to, or if you make a mistake, you might hold it against yourself. So start learning how to practice some self-forgiveness even in your practice world, let alone being a patient. You just have to give yourself some slack. Uh, because it's, it's too hard to be perfect all the time doing this stuff. And, and if you do, you'll not be very happy. And the minute you can do self-forgiveness, it becomes a lot more manageable. And it's actually more normal. Okay, it's more of the way things are. So you want to practice some forgiveness. Um, so you have to tell yourself, you know, I do good most of the time. So it's that positive self-talk. Sounds like psycho babble. <laughs> you know, when you kind of dismiss it as that, but actually it's very much what you do. You know, you have to encourage yourself. I'm going to study for one more hour. I'm going to fire up. I can pull this off. Okay? I've, I've done good nine days out of ten, and on the tenth day I messed up, but that's only one day out of ten. That's not, nine, that's not ten out of ten. So I'm okay. And it's okay. It really is. It's actually more than okay. So you want to help them see positive and do positive self-talk. Okay, getting over a relapse. How can you call? Who can you call on to help you when you've slipped up, or who can help you get back in the right frame of mind? How many of y'all have a person that you call when you are in the the blues, or you're kind of depressed and down and out? Do y'all have who? Do, do y'all who? Who in the room has somebody they would call the phone and talk to? or email or whatever you do, but, but you call. Okay, and I'm sure you had to call that person a number of times this year. Okay, because you'll get into places where it's Friday night and I've got that stupid test on money. I'm just sick of this stuff. And I don't really want to go there, but I, I have to do this. And, okay, okay, so you call people and they talk you over the edge, talk you off the edge. <laughs> oh, sorry, 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 I don't want that. They talk you off the ledge, move you back from the edge so that you can stay on the solid ground again. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> talk to you earlier. See you later. That's right. But there are those folks. It is very important to ask your patients who that is. I like to ask them. I always ask them point blank. When you get in trouble and you've messed up and you're feeling kind of bad about stuff, who do you actually call and talk to? And they, most people can tell you who it is, my sister, you know, my whatever. Uh, but every once in a while, I find somebody who has nobody. That's really kind of sad, and it's more than you might think. Um, I, I'm, I've always been surprised about that, that the, net, the social network <coughs> around people 
is more fragile in a, a large number of people than you would think. There is nobody. And so they would just have to deal with it themselves. There wouldn't be a phone call. Who calls you to see how you're doing? Nobody. Okay, that always just kind of tears me up because I, then I don't know if my, I don't know what my next step is, you know. But I eventually got to the next step of, well, who would you call? You know, think about it. I'd start encouraging them to develop a social network of some sort. Who is it? Do you have a church? Do you have a friend in the uh, place where you live? Is there somebody down the street? Who was your good friend, you know, when you were earlier in life? And try to encourage them to reactivate some relationship because people need people to stay on track for almost anything they do. Um, and a lot of you just have encouragement because your families are attentive. They pay attention and they want you to do well and they care about you. There are some people where there just aren't people who care about whether you do okay or not, and that's sad. Okay, so you have to encourage them to find their peeps, where, where they are. Okay? All right. Getting the support you need. We've already talked about this. Describe the kind of support from others that will help you with whatever. Describe the things other people do that help or hinder your efforts. Um, how does so-and-so affect your relationships with family and friends? Kind of getting into the relationship thing. Okay, let's look at this in a little more detail using Don B as an example. Okay, we talked about this earlier. It was raised that when a person has a disease, it's not just them, it's all the people in their family that also are drawn into this. Diabetes affects the whole family um, or those the person is living with. Uh, close relationships are affected, but we also know this, every family group is very different. If you try to project your sense of family unity and a family circle on somebody else, you'll be making a mistake a lot of times because people's worlds are not wired like ours as a general rule. So you want to explore what their network is. Okay? and identify what the family feels about the person having the disease. Fear is the most common emotion. Whether they know it or not, it, it may not even come out that way. It may come out they're mad at me, they're angry with me, they don't like it that I have heart disease, they don't like to have diabetes, they don't like to have lung disease, they don't like that I have arthritis. And so it comes to the patient as if they are angry with them for just living, you know, and having the disease. What's foundational is that that anger, anger is a secondary emotion. It's not the prime mover. So the prime mover for anger is either fear, which is what a lot of families are experiencing, or it's frustration. And frustration and fear project as anger on people. So uh, if a person is uh, feeling that their family is mad at them, often, more often than not, it's for fear. Let's say it's the mother or let's say it's the father. Now everybody's afraid they're going to die early or something bad's going to happen. Or what, what if she dies early, what am I going to do? What's going to happen to me? So they begin to be afraid. And it's that fear that drives the relationship from that point forward. Uh, family and friends may have unrealistic expectations. They may even blame the patient. I talked about that earlier where they might say, you did this, you ate yourself into this diagnosis. Some people can be pushing and controlling. That happens a bunch uh, with diabetes, people trying to control and manage them. Controlling people create power struggles with the one who has diabetes. Okay, that happens more often than you think. And why are they controlling? Because they feel like they're responsible. Okay, let's say if a husband wife, husband's got diabetes. Wife feels like she's responsible for how well the husband does. So they get into controls over food and who's eating what and where folks go and uh, all the behaviors. You know, sitting on the couch not doing anything and you're eating all those potato chips. And then it's a fight all the time. Uh, so it, it, it can happen, but you need to help the patient understand you're the one who's got it. You're the one who has to deal with it. And you sometimes have to help the family get it too. I, I would encourage people to bring family members to a visit. Uh, we used to do group Dobby's education classes just as foundational knowledge before then individualizing care for the long haul. And they would say, can I bring so-and-so? It's like, bring anybody. I don't care. Bring, bring the folks in here. 
because it's interesting when the family start hearing what was going on, they learned a lot that was useful, uh, and you can get them to talk about stuff in that space. And then on individual visits, bring your significant other or others. It's not a bad thing. It, it actually can be helpful. You can enlist their support. They begin to be more knowledgeable and more sensitive. Okay. Here's, you can teach people how to talk to each other. I know that sounds crazy, but actually there is a way to do it in a way that is more helpful than not. Uh, we talked about some of, of the motivational interviewing, how to phrase things, what you're trying to do. There are ways for a person with a chronic illness to talk to family members or others that actually helps those people around them get it in a way that's not provocative or picking a fight. So I statements are take responsibility. You statements put people on the defensive. Two examples. I feel annoyed when you say that I shouldn't eat this or that. Okay, that's you owning your feeling. I feel annoyed. That's just a fact. That's, that's how you feel. But if you do it the other way, you make me annoyed when you tell me I shouldn't eat this or that. That puts the other person on the defensive. So just own yourself. It's an I statement. They, when you start going you, you're judging and pointing out, you need to do this. Well, what do you need to do? You know, it's like, okay, you worry about you and I worry about me. But those you and I statements are very important. I've seen family members talk, and you can see it at the very beginning. They're sitting there, well, you know, you do that. And they're just back and like, okay, just, okay, time out. Just, you, have to, you, can't, you can't pop them, but you have to go, okay, I understand. Y'all are very frustrated. Then you have to start kind of getting in the middle of it to, to break it up, break it up, move along. Nothing to see here. Okay, <laughs> acknowledge. Step two is acknowledge the family's concern. So first of all, I sentences, you own your problem. Number two, you have to acknowledge that they're concerned about you. Um, they usually have the best interests at heart. Um, if you acknowledge their concern, it makes them feel valued. So often people talk past each other and nothing happens. It goes on for years, literally years, of just bad communication. So. Before you do an I statement, you soften the sense that you're criticizing by acknowledging the family concern beforehand. So here it is. It's the still thing, I feel annoyed when you do that. Okay, you're still owning it, but before you say that, I know you care about me when you say I shouldn't eat this or that, but I feel annoyed when you say that. Okay, now they've been respected, heard, and appreciated, and then you say how you feel. That's honest. That's honest communications. That's like any time you need to deliver bad news about anything, think about things that respect and are positive before you move into this road. If you just come out there and hit folks upside the head with the bad, they can't hear you. They stop listening. Let's finish and we'll, we'll take a break. We're right in a good stopping place. Okay, number three, say what you need. Be specific in what you want people to do differently. Example, I know you care about me when you say I shouldn't eat this or that. That's the acknowledgement. But I feel annoyed when you do that. The patient takes responsibility. Now the specific request. It would help me a lot more if you just comment when you think I'm doing something good for myself. That's asking them to be an encourager, basically. Okay. Things you can do. Let's just stop. We'll, we'll pick up here. This is a good break point. We'll look at that. So give yourselves about 10 minutes and then we'll come back in finish up.